The University of Nebraska-Lincoln is celebrating its 150th anniversary this year. Chancellor Ronnie Green talks about the university's history and big plans for the future, plus his thoughts on the challenges facing higher education. That's tonight on Speaking of Nebraska. Thanks for joining us on Speaking of Nebraska. I'm NET News Director Dennis Kellogg. Tonight, Fred Knapp will bring us the latest from the tax and budget debates at the State House, and Allison Mullenkamp updates us on flood recovery efforts across the state. But first, we take a look back at the past 150 years of the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. Chancellor Ronnie Green highlighted the university's beginning more than a century ago during this year's State of the University Address. The University of Nebraska has been and will continue to be the DNA of Nebraska and beyond. And yes, that is something truly to celebrate. In a time where the number of high school graduates is lagging nationally, our enrollment in the past three years has been in historically record levels. This academic year, we enrolled 25,820 undergraduate, graduate, and professional students. We should be very rightfully proud of our efforts to keep a Nebraska education affordable. Our Board of Regents and our university administration have worked hard over the past six years to keep our annual tuition increases well below the national norm. We remain together with the University of Iowa, the best tuition value in the Big Ten. And our students upon graduation have 23% less student debt than the national average. Now, while we certainly have much to celebrate in the momentum of the university as we've outlined across our missions here, we must also be conscious of the larger environment around us and the considerable what I would call headwinds for higher education, funding and budget pressures, political our potential federal policy, excuse me, changes related to immigration status in Title IX, declining international enrollments in higher ed across the U.S., increased racist behavior, and additional concerns about mental health issues on campuses all present challenges. And while these headwinds have indeed been stiff at times, we have been and continue to be steadfast in our efforts to confront them and to prevent any interruption of our momentum. Chancellor Ronnie Green joins us now to talk more about the significant milestone for the university, 150 years. And first of all, Chancellor, welcome to Speaking of Nebraska. It's great to be here, Dennis. The uh, original charter in 1869 focused on literature, science, and the arts. So how different do you think our educational focus is today from way back then? Well, you, you know, if you try to put yourself back in 1869, it was a little hard for all of us to do, but imagining, you know, Lincoln as a fledgling you know, startup community on the plains, brand new town, brand new place, brand new state, a couple of years old from statehood time. And the founding of the land grant university, how we were founded as a, a university under the 1862 Morrill Act, um, created this opportunity for education to be broadened to all, rather than being more of an elite good or for for only access to you know, those kinds of opportunities. And originally, you know, the design of the University of Nebraska was to have six colleges. Um, one of those was Literature, Science, and the Arts, and that was the original one where all of the students who came to the university at that time studied. Uh, but um, now, to a comprehensive university across all fields, all areas of study, a, a, a big public research university. I'm sure the founders could have never imagined that, right? <laughs> right. From that kind of fledgling start in 1869. So uh, uh, certainly we have seen a broadening from what the original land grant act was, which was heavily designed to be in agriculture, mechanical arts, engineering, military science mm -hmm. in the 
kind of origin days of the land grant system to now comprehensive across you know 175 fields on our campus, um, 168 graduate programs across our, our, our university. So as part of the 150th, you set up a commission to kind of look forward to the next 25 years. What did you take away from, from the findings of that commission? Well, I think we, we took away certainly that uh, the need for uh, public education and, and how we're founded as a land-grant university is, has never been more vivid than it is today, even though we're 150 years you know, young, so to speak, that our, our mission of, of teaching and broad education and of research and of ex an outreach to the state that we serve here in Nebraska um, has, has never been more needed, right, first of all, but that we also see the opportunity for the university to engage in that education in, a, in an even more powerful way um, than, than we have traditionally done or, or have been doing. Um, things like, for example, all, from our student perspective as undergraduates, that at every student be experientially focused as well as academically focused. So gaining experience in the real world and in a hands-on way as part of that education uh, about uh, the opportunity for them all to be engaged in work in research, for them all to be engaged in work in problem solving in communities. That was a big takeaway of the, you know, the vision for how we plan to move forward into the future. And, and um, I, I would say on the research side, you know, we, we're a, a prominent world leading research university, um, but that, that there are big kind of wicked grand challenges that are out there today um, that the world needs research on and that, that our focus in the future will be on solving those big wicked grand challenges and kind of coalescing our research effort around that kind of environment. So a number of those things came out of that visioning mm -hmm. process mm -hmm. um, and, um, and in building further the impact of the university moving forward. One of the challenges for higher education across the country is always diversity. And in that original charter, it said no one was gonna be deprived of the privileges of this university because of age, sex, color, or nationality. On your campus, I think it's about 15% that you have of minority students. You're looking to enroll more students from outside of Nebraska. What's the right mix of students that you're shooting for? Yeah, I, so, so you're right. If you go back to that original charter that we're celebrating this year, and it talks about everyone is, it doesn't use those words, but it says everyone is welcome, all uh, national, even nationalities mm -hmm. is mentioned. Um, and you think about those first students when I was talking a few minutes ago about the formative days of the university. The very, if you look then, that first class of students, there were 120 students who matriculated originally at the university. 110 of those were Latin preparatory school mm -hmm. students. They were finishing high school, so to speak, mm -hmm. to be able to go on to, a, to advanced study. And 20 of them were university students. Seven were women at the time. So it's a lot of people find that to be a real surprise, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, fast forward to today, as you talked about, 15% um, of our population today, of our nearly 26,000 students on campus this past year, uh, being in underrepresented minority groups. Uh, about a third of our student population today comes from outside of Nebraska. Uh, about 12 and a half percent of our student population comes from all over the world, from, in, from international locations around the world, 136 countries around the world where students come to us from and are studying with us. Um, right mix, you know, and to get to your point about mm -hmm. is there a, a right mix? We, we want this to be as an open and welcoming place for all as possible, and then we strive for that. Um, I just actually came from an award ceremony for inclusive excellence um, earlier today where we were celebrating that. So I, I would predict, if I was a predicting person, I would say that we'll probably end up somewhere in the 60% residents from Nebraska across all 93 counties in the state and about 40% outside the US. And we certainly would expect to see increased um, representation of 
of um, uh, underrepresented minorities at much higher levels than, than we're at today. You also just had another graduation recently, so another class is out there with the special skills that they've gained through the University of Nebraska at Lincoln. Do you think as a state, Nebraska is doing enough to capitalize on the skills that your graduates are bringing to the job market? Uh, I, I think we would certainly like to keep more and more and more of our students uh, here in Nebraska. And we, we currently, if you look at our, our graduates, so we did just graduate our largest class in history uh, this past weekend. Um, about 3,500 new graduates of the, of the University of Nebraska-Lincoln campus, about 300 more than we've ever graduated in our history in a, in a year. Um, and we are currently at about three-fourths of those students do stay in Nebraska or they start they're here and start their careers and their families and their lives in Nebraska. The other fourth go hither, yon, and, and across the world. Um, we certainly would like to see all of them stay in Nebraska. <laughs> Nebraska. Sure. But, uh, but we, we uh, are seeing that number increase. Uh, we've talked a lot about over the last uh, period of time about the need for workforce development in the state and about increasing the number of opportunities for our students in the state. Um, so uh, we, we certainly are, are working hard to make sure all of that talent you know, stays here as well. And of course, I'm sure you're paying attention to the budget discussions as well. And, and uh, figures show that uh, University of Nebraska Lincoln has a, an impact economically on the state in several billion dollars. Um, but how do you feel as the legislature goes through this, this discussion? How do you feel about what kind of money we're putting towards higher education in Nebraska? Well, uh, the state has a lot to balance, right? So. Um, uh, I know that the, the legislators, when they're working on our budgets as we speak almost mm -hmm. here today, that uh, they have a lot of needs to balance in the state budget. And Nebraska has traditionally been a state, even since our founding that we were talking about back into that eight, eight, mid-1800s time period, that has supported uh, higher education uh, very highly and has valued it very highly. We continue to see uh, levels of support that puts us into the, the, the better half of the country in terms of higher education support. But with that said, there has been a decline in higher education support over time. So if you look at it on a on an ongoing basis, we certainly have less of the support for the university today that comes from state appropriated dollars than what we would have seen over the last you know, several decades of time. And that continues to decrease due to competing needs in the state budget that are there for a lot of other uh, priorities that they have to balance. Um, and we've, we've had to offset some of that with the way that we fund the university and tuition. And uh, you know, if you go back in our history, a kind of interesting historical point, uh, we, there was not a dollar of tuition charged to a student at the University of Nebraska until 1923. It was a dollar a credit hour. A credit hour. At that point in time, um, and it's now you know it's changed over time to where the the cost of that education is now more shared between the student and the state. Mm -hmm. uh, but we. We enjoy high levels of support, and I want to say that very strongly because we do value and have very strong levels of support from the state for their university. You mentioned the, you know, the DNA of Nebraska, I think, in the tape mm -hmm. that was seen earlier. Mm -hmm. uh, there's that strong sense of the state being uh, affiliated with, tied to, and the DNA of the state being associated uh, with the university, and so we, we feel very strong about our support from the state. Of course, support affects tuition, and tuition nationally is climbing. Um, we're seeing that the cost of a four-year degree has uh, doubled over time. We're seeing that uh, student loan debt has increased, and the average graduate nationally, again, has about $28,000 mm -hmm. in student loan debts. Talk a little bit about how you tell uh, a student and, a, and their parents that, that this education is worth that kind of money. Yeah, so, the, so it's certainly an investment in their future. Right, so we know that the vast majority of careers and, and jobs that are there in the workforce and will be there in the future in the workforce uh, do require that college degree or that level of higher education attainment. And so when you look at all of the data, you look at the lifetime earnings projections for 
a person with a, with a college degree versus a high school degree or versus a two-year degree. There are dramatic differences in those lifetime earnings. So it's, it's an investment for the future, certainly, in that, from that perspective, and we describe it that way. Um, the fact that we do have student debt now that we wouldn't have necessarily thought of 30 years ago or 40 years ago at the same levels is still an investment in that future. We're very proud of the fact that in Nebraska, our students here do graduate with about a quarter less debt, 25% below the, the national average of debt. That's partially because we've been able to keep tuition low or we've managed and very carefully planned trying to keep tuition at manageable levels so that we can be in a, an accessible land-grant university. Access is our number one key word. Mm -hmm. Access to the highest quality education, we believe that in the very core of our being. I'm a first-generation educated college student. You can absolutely believe mm -hmm. that, that I value that at our number one you know, highest level of, of priority for access to education for all. Um, so the combination of those factors has allowed us to keep that debt down, but it still is an investment in the future. Let's switch gears a little bit and talk about the devastating flood that has swept across eastern Nebraska in particular. You and the University of Nebraska and the entire system has kind of made this a priority. Mm -hmm. Why? Well, it's part of our land-grant mission, number one, to the state, as, a, as we've been talking about here. We, we serve in outreach and engagement to the state through the university and a whole variety of ways. So first and foremost there, um, we also know that you know, we have students who have been impacted by the flooding, they and their families, communities that are across the state and in a number of places, as you well know, that have been impacted, mm -hmm. and that the recovery effort, uh, not just the response that happened, you know, initially in that first 30 to 45 days, but now this long road of recovery that will be there from a disaster of this magnitude, um, that that engagement is a part of who we who we are and what we do as, as an institution. So initially, it was very centered on, uh, the response effort uh, was centered on what can we do for students who were impacted, for families who were impacted, for university family members. You know, we have uh, employees who were impacted directly across the university. Um, and now it's shifted to how do we really help communities respond to, you know, and, and recover from these flooding efforts. So we have a variety of things that are happening there, primarily through Nebraska Extension with the university, that third leg of our tri mm -hmm. stool at UNL, um, where we're working directly with communities across the university system. We've established a student serviceship program that we're funding uh, for students to go into communities for the summer, working with these communities directly. Uh, and we're, we're putting 50 students out across communities that were impacted in those watersheds where the flooding occurred. Uh, so it, it's, it's, it, it's part of our, our mission right. that we're, right. we're involved in and feel very, very strongly about that. The Med Center obviously is very involved sure. on the health, health side and has been uh, as well. We just have about 30 seconds left, but I, I want to get your uh, reaction. Pr uh, President Hank Bounds has announced he's going to be stepping down. What do you see as the two or three most important qualities in the next president of the university? Uh, I think that, well, obviously we need someone that is going to be a great higher education leader. I mean, that goes without saying. Mm -hmm. But um, I, I think we, we need a president who will uh, resonate with Nebraska. Hank did a great job at that, mm -hmm. and we need a, a president who will come in and resonate strongly with the state and the, how the, the university relates to the state. Um, I think we need someone who's going to come in and, and uh, be a strong representative right. of the university. Right. Um, so uh, I'm, I have no doubt we're going to hire a great next president <laughs> of the University of Nebraska. Sounds good. Chancellor Ronnie Green, thank you very much for being with us today. Appreciate it. Thank you for having me. This interview and tonight's program are available on our website. Just go to netnebraska.org slash speaking of Nebraska.
It's getting down to crunch time in the legislature when senators have to make some big decisions, including what to do about property taxes and school funding. Joining me now is NET News' Fred Knapp, who's been watching all of this at the Capitol. And Fred, that original proposal from the Revenue Committee, is that still alive? It is. It's not clear how much strength it has, but uh, it began debating uh, this week. Senator Linehan introduced it. This was the bill that raises sales taxes and imposes taxes on things like pop and candy, uh, car repair, home repair, um, in order to uh, raise revenue, to increase school aid, and drive down property taxes, which are the uh, of which schools are the major user. So, as I said, Senator Linehan introduced it and immediately ran into criticism from Senator Ernie Chambers. LB 289 provides property tax relief for every property owner, homeowners, commercial property owners, and agricultural producers. LB 289 significantly increases state aid to public schools. But to so casually say you're going to raise the sales tax by a half percent and that makes Nebraska competitive with other states, what do I care about other states? I live here. The poor people I see live in this state. Is it competitive for the poor people? You all don't care about the poor because you're not poor. You don't have to go to the store and count pennies to see if you can buy the bread. And what Senator Chambers was referring to was Senator Linehan saying that even if Nebraska increases its sales tax by half a cent, it's still competitive with surrounding states. So was that sales tax increase the biggest objection? No. Uh, another big objection is by the large schools which receive... Uh, almost all of the state aid to schools now, they're worried that uh, if the distribution formula is reoriented, as this bill proposes to do, to send more of it on a per-pupil basis to more rural districts uh, instead of uh, concentrating on urban districts with high populations in poverty and, and so forth, that the next time a state budget crunch hits, they could be cut and lose funding. So we've seen the opening round of debate. What is next for this bill? And if it fails to advance, does that mean that we're not going to have any property tax relief this year? The next thing for this bill is uh, they have to show the speaker, Jim Shear, that they are within spitting distance of enough support to be able to cut off a filibuster, which takes 33 votes. There's talk that they're going to do a fly around, go around the state, uh, trying to convince people to uh, uh, show their support for this bill. Uh, and uh, if this bill doesn't make it, then the, uh, the property tax relief is down to um, uh, $51 million that the governor originally proposed to add to an existing property tax credit fund, and that was part of the budget debate. Senators also focusing on that budget debate this week, so let's talk a little bit about that. There's been some initial debate, but has there been any shakeup from the original proposal? Well, the uh, committee had originally, the Appropriations Committee, which proposes the budget, originally cut in half the governor's suggestion. He was going to add $51 million a year to uh, the property tax credit fund. That's the, the state fund that they send out to local governments to buy down your property taxes. If you own a $100,000 house, it would have reduced your property taxes by about $86 this year. If they add the $51 million a year the governor wants to, that would take that up to about $106 next year. So that's what's left of property tax relief at this point. And like I say, the committee wanted to send half of that to the cash reserve, the state's rainy day fund, to guard against future revenue shortfalls. That didn't fly. All right, so and we only have a couple of weeks left of this session, a few weeks left, and so we'll be watching it closely. I know you will be. Fred, thanks so much for your time today. Thank you. And be sure to keep pace with what's happening in the legislature each day. Listen for Fred's updates on NET Radio at 545 and 745 weekday mornings and 545 in the evening. And you can read his stories each day on our website at netnebraska.org slash news. Flooding in March left a lasting mark on much of eastern Nebraska. Allison Mollenkamp has been covering the flooding for the past several weeks. She joins us now to talk about recovery and rebuilding. Allison, bring us up to date. Where do we stand right now? 
Absolutely. So in terms of aid from the federal government, FEMA so far has given out about $21 million in individual assistance, and that's for homeowners and renters to get their living space back to a place where they can live in it. Maybe that's tearing out moldy carpet, things like that. The Small Business Administration has given out about $25 million in low interest loans, and that's to homeowners, renters, businesses to supplement that FEMA assistance. And on the other side, there is a lot of loss that we're looking at in the state in the agricultural sector. They're seeing about $44 million, or sorry, $440 million million in loss of crop damage, and that's unplanted crops or late planting, and also about $400 million in lost livestock. Well, let's talk about agriculture a little bit more. You've been out, you've been talking with farmers, so tell us a little bit about the struggles that they're having, in particular, just trying to get into the field. Yes, so a lot of these farmers that are close to the rivers or streams that have flooded are dealing with a lot of debris in their field, so that can be silt and sand or built up corn stalks, but they're also dealing with holes in their fields called scour holes, and that's where water and ice has ripped a gash in the land. And I talked to one farmer who has three of these large scour holes, and he says just one would take him two weeks of 12 hour days to fill in, and that's a lot of time and a lot of money that a lot of these farmers may just not have. And so he's still considering whether it's worth it to put in all that work to plant the field when it's possible there may be more flooding this summer and undo all the work he did. So do you think when all is said and done, we're going to see a lot of these fields go unplanted? That's what what the the Corn Board and other, other groups are anticipating, that it may just not be worth it for a lot of these farmers to put in the time and get those fields planted as we're we're running out of time um, to plant those fields. And transportation has also been uh, uh, an issue that's affecting, going to affect the price as well. Yes, so producers will often sell their their soy or corn to uh, transporters, to handlers of grain, and those handlers right now can't necessarily get the product into uh, the rivers or in not into a river on a, a barge or into trains. And if they don't have anything to do with it, they don't want to buy more, so they lower the price to discourage farmers from bringing in those grains. And are we expecting more rain, a a wet summer ahead? Yes, the National Weather Service is predicting a wetter than usual summer, higher than average precipitation, and if it does rain, that water has nowhere to go. The soil across the region is soaking wet, and so that water pretty much immediately becomes flood water. The struggle continues for agriculture, for farmers, and for everybody, really, in eastern Nebraska, businesses as well. Yes. Yeah, thanks, Allison. appreciate your reporting. Thanks. Stay up to date on the news that matters to you with our daily signature stories. This week, Allison brings us more about the difficult farmers, the difficulties that farmers are facing in the fields after the devastating flood. And in another recent signature story, Brandon McDermott looked at efforts to break the cycle of foster care for Nebraska families within the system. You can find those stories and all of our signature stories online at netnebraska.org slash news. You can also find our stories on Facebook and Twitter. Just follow us at NET News Nebraska. That's all for this week on Speaking of Nebraska. Thanks to UNL Chancellor Ronnie Green for joining us. Also Fred Knapp and Allison Mullenkamp for their reporting and all of those behind the scenes who work to bring you this show every week. Next week, we'll dig deeper into the flooding disaster impacting Nebraskans. Until then, I'm NET News Director Dennis Kellogg. Thanks for joining us.